is Bob Kimright. I'm in the Department of Plant Pathology at the University of Georgia. I'm the Extension Specialist on the cotton team, the UGA cotton team, who deals with diseases and nematode management. And that's what we'll talk about today. It's an informal group. If you've got questions as we go along, don't hesitate to stop and ask me. I want to make sure that everybody understands. I've got some data, but the data is only there to illustrate a point. And what I'll tell all throughout the talk and what I'll tell this afternoon is there are three things I want you to remember if you don't remember anything else. Okay? The first thing is, and we'll talk about this, the weather that's setting up. You know, it's supposed to rain today. It's going to rain tomorrow. It rained last week. It's going to rain next week. All of that has an impact on our cotton production and other crops as well. So by understanding, you know, I got here today. All right? If you wore out from our walk this morning, okay? <laughs> I'm still catching my breath. All right, thanks. Um, that the impact of the weather we're going to have is going to be something that growers need to manage. The impact it's going to have on diseases and possibly on them with those will. Hey, so. Second thing is we have now better nematode options than we've had in the past. Right? We all remember Temic being lost. Okay. Now we have Bellum Total coming on. We have Telon with the uh, prescription map site-specific applications, and we also have resistant varieties. And we'll talk about why that is a factor more so than it ever has been. And then we're going to talk about foliar diseases. Right? Georgia and Alabama, Austin Hagen at Auburn University, myself, we stand firmly behind the importance, the importance of managing target spot when it needs to be managed. Okay? Managed with fungicides. We've got a host of new fungicides that could be applied this year. The question is, do you need to apply them? And when would you apply them? Because we want to make money doing it. And the last thing is, along those lines, is the big story last year in foliar disease was not target spot in Georgia, though it was an issue, but not as much as it had been. It was a disease called angular leaf spot or bacterial blight. We'll talk about that. The weather and the impact on disease, the options for nematode management, okay, and also foliar disease control. How can you invest your money in 2016? Okay? That's the main thing. When it comes to disease and nematode management, we're not managing nematodes, we're not managing diseases simply to do it. It's an investment. You have the opportunity to invest your money in one way or another as far as how you're going to manage those problems. So when we talk about seed, the investment you can make is the variety you're going to plant. And like I said, the varieties we have this year are exciting. Okay? They're exciting because not only are they resistant, not perfect, not bulletproof, but they've come a long way. But they also have the yield potential, which a lot of times throws growers off. Our seed treatments, fungicides and matticide seed treatments. You know, if we didn't have El Nino this year, if I wasn't expecting cooler, wetter soils of planting, I probably wouldn't even talk about the fungicides on seed treatments. I've talked about that every year since 2000 when I got here, and we know the story. But we need to emphasize that again this year. Okay? Matticide seed treatments, fungicides for target spots. And again, I've been talking about that. Austin's been talking about that. We've been talking in the southeast. And what's changed this year is not that we think it's any more or less important, but we have additional products I want to talk to you about. And then the management of nematodes. And a big change this year with nematicides has been the advent of vellum total. Vellum total came out last year. Keith Russell from Bear Crab Science has been one of the tip of the spear on that. Vellum total on cotton is not bulletproof. You want to use it in the right field. You want to put it out correctly. It's a liquid in a furrow. We'll talk about it. Okay? Temic was never bulletproof. But where we've used Temic in the past, vellum total from an amatocide standpoint, is a critical player now. Okay? Philip Roberts, just to mention this, vellum total is a product that controls nematodes and thrips. When you hear Philip Roberts talk, or entomologist, he has a different idea, or an additional idea, not a different idea, additional idea about how we use vellum total. Here's Philip right now. So if you hear his talk, he'll be talking about it. Okay? When you leave here today, when you leave this class at 850, what I want you to have is a better idea of this SDHI fungicides, how they're impacting our disease control and also our nematode control. The SDHI, they're the new sexy class in peanuts, in <coughs> cotton, in corn, in soybean. Just bringing a new class or, ex or expanding upon an existing class to help us with our disease control. El Nino, we've talked about that, that impact. And then problems, nematode, fusarium wilt, target spot. If you grow cotton in Fifth County, 
and south and east of here, going I-75 up to Evans County, the Claxton area, anywhere in this area, we're seeing an increase in fusarium wilt. We're seeing it in Cook County. We're seeing it in Thomas County. We're seeing it in Decatur County. Okay? We're seeing it across the region. We're going to talk about what fusarium wilt may or may not mean. Okay? First thing is, like I say, it's going to rain today, it's going to rain tomorrow, it rained last week, we've had warmer temperatures, we almost didn't have a winter until earlier this month, three weeks ago, okay, I saw cotton regrowth, I saw volunteer tobacco, I saw peanuts, I didn't say no, I said take that back, you see peanuts, I saw corn, so regrowth corn, regrowth tobacco, regrowth uh, cotton, we'll talk about that, but all it is is an increase in temperature by a couple degrees centigrade off the coast of South America. You know, it's one of those things, if you put your finger in a bowl of water that was a couple degrees centigrade different, you'd have a tough time telling the difference in temperature. It's not much, but it's enough energy in the size of the Pacific Ocean that it's driving everything we're experiencing now. And what's happened earlier is the jet stream was not able to push down and bring cold Arctic air. I make a good weather person. I want to be a weather person, all right? But what we've done is we've stacked up, we've had a lot of boxcar effect, boxcar of storms coming across. And that's been the big story. It will continue to be the big story. But as we move into late spring and into summer, this condition will fade. Can't tell you what's going to happen as far as summertime goes. But we continue to see into at least early spring the same kind of patterns. So what's the impact? What's so important? Why when you walk out of here do I want you to know this? First thing is this wet weather and the temperature. First thing is nematodes. Here's the magic number for nematodes, and these are ballpark figures, okay? Don't hold my feet to the fire on them exactly, but they're what we use. Soils that are warmer than 65 degrees Fahrenheit. The nematodes, the parasitic nematodes feeding on your crops, on your cotton, remain active and they remain hungry. <clears throat> they continue to feed. And when we had warm soil conditions throughout the winter time up until early January, they were active. What also 65 degrees Fahrenheit a magic number for? Seedling diseases. If the soil temperatures at planting are above 65 degrees, we have a reduced chance of seedling disease. If they're below 65 degrees, our chance of seedling disease increases. Not because the pathogen, not because the rhizoctonia likes it, but because that cotton plant really doesn't like it. It slows that seed down and the pathogen jumps on it. 50 degrees is the second magic number. Above 65 degrees, the nematodes are happy. They're eating. They're feeding. Below 65 degrees, they start to slow down. And when you get to 50 degrees soils, they quit doing much of anything. They're either in an egg form or they're just associated with the root. Okay? Not doing much. What soils that plant? First thing for corn growers in the room, I'm really worried about what's going to do for delaying corn planting. Okay? Well, that's another story. Delayed planting may delay our cotton planting to some, but those who need to use Tellum. Okay? Tellum is an outstanding product. Three gallons per acre, it is an outstanding product, but it has to be used in a situation where it fumigates properly. Tellum is a liquid injected in the soil, it vaporizes, and as it vaporizes and moves the soil moisture, it kills things. It kills everything. Okay? Soil is too wet, it doesn't vaporize, it sits or it moves with the water and it does it moves down rather than up. That's a problem. The other thing is cool wet soils, obviously seedling disease, as we said. <coughs> seedling diseases, we have several the most important would be Rhizoctonia sorcian and then Pythium. Rhizoctonia sorcian is when that plant comes up, gets about this high, and then it crashes over. The Rhizoctonia eats it right at the knees, hence the name sorcian. Pythium, you might not ever know you have Pythium. If you have a stand that doesn't come up, the Pythium pride jumps on it. Okay? This is old stuff. This is not new. This is nothing that you really came to this meeting for to hear about. But the main thing I want to point out is if we're set up, for cooler, wetter conditions, which slow the vigor of the cotton plant now, we may need some extra help. Under a normal year, that cotton seed you already plant, it's got two to three fungicides already on it that you don't pay anything extra for. And under a normal year, they look good. We really don't see a benefit from an added treatment. 
But in a year where we actually put out the rhizoctonia or conditions are favorable for disease, the base C treatment here, base plus overcoat, it doesn't matter what these are. Okay? This is the base. This is spending some extra money for an overcoat. The base, spending some extra money for an overcoat. In a year where you've got the potential for a problem, you can invest in protecting your seed, especially if you're reducing your seeding rate. You can do that by increasing your, I didn't even recognize you come in here. You know all about this, don't you? Yes, We've sir. done this. Yes, sir. I'm going to tell you what, here's this, this gentleman's come a long way to go. We did some tests with him, and when he's making, when it's a bad year, and we got a lot of seedling disease, and you're making like 500 pounds of cotton per acre, most growers would throw you off their farm. They would not pick your test. He didn't smile much, but he always helped us get this kind of data, so we're glad you're here. You've come a long way to be here at 8 o'clock this morning. All right, so the point of this is, in a tough year, investing in an overcoat, an additional one, whether it's Dynasty, whether it's Trilex, any of these products out there that increase your resistance or increase your control may be a good option. Okay? I'm not saying you have to do it, but it does improve your odds as far as getting a good stand. Pros and cons, extra fungicides add extra protection, stand loss, and diseases. Added insurance, they protect your investment in the seed. They are convenient. You know, we used to put out in furrow fungicides. We rarely do that now. They have the convenience of the seed treatment, but the increased stand may or may not increase your yield. It just depends upon what the risk is, how much disease is out there. Okay? Why mention it? Simply to bring your attention to the fact that this is the kind of year with the El Nino conditions where I expect at this point seedling disease could be a major factor in some fields. Okay? Let's talk about nematodes. Nematodes really matter. They'll always matter. This isn't the same field, but it's close by. This field is in Colquitt County. This was taken in mid-October. Ty in the back took this picture on January the 3rd. I don't know where you were, but you were somewhere next near Colquitt County here in South Georgia. All right? These stocks were mowed. These weren't. It doesn't really matter. What should have happened is by January 3rd, 2016, that should have been dead sticks. It should have been dead sticks. And everywhere we went in early January, up until recently, we had regrowth on cotton. And the problem with that is as long as those nematodes have a host that's alive, a cotton plant that's alive, they don't care if it's tall or short, got cotton on it or not, if the roots are alive, the nematodes are feeding. And it takes approximately, depending upon temperature, but approximately 21 days for that root knot nematode to go from an egg to a female that infects the root, that forms a gall, that produces more eggs. The cycle takes 21 days. And if you take October, November, December, into January, that's about four 21-day periods. And so by having the cotton alive that long in a year like this, <laughs> we're setting ourselves up for even more nematode populations when we come in. This isn't scary. This guy isn't falling. All right? But what I am saying is cotton behind cotton this year, because of the soil conditions we had, if you had a nematode problem to start with, it's going to be worse going into 2016. Why? Because the conditions favor you. Do we have to pull stalks? We don't have to pull stalks. Do we have to harrow stalks up? We don't have to do that, especially if the weather, weather turns cold. But this year, when it didn't turn cold, this is what can happen. Right? Any questions on that? Just be prepared for it. 21 days is the magic number at 65 degrees Fahrenheit. And that on January 3rd, 2016, is not our friend. Questions on that? Okay. You know what? Yeah. I don't know. You know, we, didn't, we don't have tenure. And that, you know, that was the name of the thing. What? You mentioned Bell. Mm -hmm. Just put it in for her. I'm coming right up to okay. that. Okay. Hold that thought. You know, it makes me happy, though, somebody cares. That you're interested <laughs> in okay. All right, that's good. We're going to lead right into that. Start off with what the nematode, uh, uh, what the nematode symptoms look like. This kind of leaf, a lot of times Stanley, cold pepper, we get caused, we'll say it's a herbicide injury, that interventional fluorosis. What that is is the plant not being able to get enough fertilizer, not enough nutrients. Whether it's poor soil fertility or poor pH, whatever it is, nematodes and damaging the crop lead to those symptoms. If you see this symptom in the field, think nematodes. All right? Second thing is, I don't need to preach to you, the choir, about what the root knot nematode is. 70% of our fields in Georgia are infested with the root knot nematode. 
The galls on there affect the uptake of nutrients, they affect the growth. Here's what you do need to know though. If you go out there and you see these symptoms and you don't see those root galls, don't immediately eliminate nematodes as the problem. Okay? Cotton in Georgia is affected by the root knot nematode in 70% of our fields. But we also have rendiform nematode affecting 10% of our fields. And sting nematode affecting some percentage of our fields and Columbia lance. And the only one that will form this is the root knot. West in Tiff County, I can take you to any number of fields where nematodes are devastating in the field and you don't see this because it's a sting nematode. All right? Just because you see these symptoms, don't quit thinking nematodes, you need to take a soil sample to figure out what it is. Why is that important this year? It's critically important because when I talk to you about these nematode resistant varieties, unless it's root knot nematode, the nematodes walk right through it. That resistance means nothing to the sting, the reniform, or the lance. We have to make sure it's the root knot nematode. And while we're talking about nematodes, one of the biggest problems I'm seeing, Wes, in Tiff County, in Berrien County, in Cook County, in Evans County, in Thomas County, in Decatur County, you get the picture, which frightens me, is the increase we're seeing in a disease called Fusarium wilt. And it used to be I saw Fusarium wilt on cotton this tall, now we're seeing it on cotton this tall. Okay? And these plants, the nematodes don't kill the plant. Usually they just don't do well. Nowadays, Fusarium wilt will kill those plants or they'll do nothing as far as you know. It looks a lot like the nematode, the root knot nematode. And in fact, the Fusarium wilt we have, it's a fungus that gets in the plant because the nematodes damage the roots. And then the fungus gets in there. And how do you tell you have it? You split that lower stem and if you see this browning in there, that discoloration of the internal parts of the plant, that is the diagnostic symptom. Stunted plants looking like that and split them and you'll see it. Okay? It's becoming an increasing problem. This is a field here in Tiff County. All right? You can see the student is standing in the middle of a patch which continues to increase. Chris Goodman has a field 20, uh, five miles east of here. And the patches start out like this and by the end of the season they're as big as this room. And I kid you not. Okay? What do we have to know? The first thing is, so far this student has shown that everything we have out there fusarium wise is linked to a nematode problem. And if it's linked to a root knot nematode problem, managing those root knot nematodes with the maticides or with resistant varieties is a good thing. But nine out of ten fields she's looked at have not been root knot nematodes, they've been the sting nematode. And sting nematodes don't care about 1558. And they'll take 49, 46 as quickly as they'll take 10, 50. Okay? If it's going to be that kind of nematode problem, we're looking for solutions, a combination of nematicides, and hopefully a fungicide intervention in the future. But fusarium wilt, if you don't know you've got it, but you've seen symptoms like that. We had a grower in Tiff County last year who, by chance, he wanted us to come look at target spot. And while we were out there, he said to the agent, and oh, by the way, I've got a spot that doesn't look too good. If you've got time, let's look at it. The target spot's nothing last year. The fusarium wilt was the real problem. Okay. Reducing nematode populations. If we want to fight nematodes, you know this as well as I do, the biggest thing we can do is to rotate away from the problem. The best rotational crop we got for cotton is peanuts. If we can grow peanuts, they do not share the same nematode host. When I talk about root knot nematode on cotton, it's different than root knot nematode on peanut. Old stuff. Rotate, harrow, turn crop, remove uh, debris, pull up stocks. We know this. Soil fumigation. This is the one I want to point out, especially today. All right? Our nematode resistant varieties that I'm leading into are getting so good that for root knot nematode that they actually have a lasting effect on the root knot nematode population in the field. If you put telone out in the field, it's got nematodes, you're going to knock them back, you're going to get great results if you put it out right. But at the end of the season, it's like you never put anything out there at all. Nematodes rebound quickly from using telone within the season. If you plant a resistant variety, like some of the ones we'll talk about, it's almost as good as planting a peanut crop. The effect on the in-season nematodes or the infield nematodes over that season versus peanuts versus resistant variety is almost like they didn't grow on the cotton at all. 
The only issue we have here is will we get resistance sometimes? Will the nematodes overcome? But at this point, a major benefit is in managing nematode populations, resistant varieties crash them. Okay? It's a headache to manage nematodes. When I'm talking about investing your money, I compare a kid Stanley Culpepper. I said that fighting weeds is like a broken leg going to the hospital. You do everything you can to not break your leg. And if you do go break your leg, nobody argues that you shouldn't go get it set. Nobody says, well, I think I'll live with it, right? You break your leg, you go get it taken care of. Nematodes are like me in weight loss. Every year I go to see the doctor. And every year the doctor tells me the same thing. He said, well, you sure didn't lose much weight, did you? Okay, and you know disease, heart disease, and diabetes is associated with weight control, right? I know that, all right? I'm not stupid, but I sure don't control my weight like I should. Nematodes are that way. All right? Nematodes are that way. We're going to fight the weeds. We're going to fight the insects. We're going to manage soil fertility. We're sure going to pick a variety that yields well. But sometimes with nematodes, we ignore it. Or we're going to say, I'm going to fight it next year. Or it's not that big of a problem. You know what? If we don't fight nematodes quickly and effectively, over time they become to take the yield, they, take the, uh, they become more difficult to control, and they can introduce through certain mode. We can't forget about them. They're a headache because we can, they're not easy to see. The damage can be linked to other things like soil fertility or, or a herbicide damage, and they're not always easy to control. They're a headache. How do we control them? Make sure it's root knot. Why? If it's reniform, if it's lance, if it's sting, for the seed, doesn't matter. The best thing about these nematode resistant, root knot nematode resistant varieties, and we'll talk about them, is they have increased efficacy and increased yield potential. If I was to ask three years ago, why aren't you planting phytogen 367? Okay? Good nematode resistant variety. The answer would typically be I don't want to set myself up from the time I plant the seed to try to play catch up with yield potential. I say, but in a nematode field, this is stop. I've seen the data. 367 versus 499, I'm not even going to go there. Well, now you don't have to go there. Seed treatments. Okay? Seed treatments of Eris and Evicta. We may have a new one coming out next year. Okay? These seed treatments offer us convenience, and they may offer us benefits as well in terms of increased protection. But these nematode, or these seed treatment nematicides, like Eris and Evicta, we want them to be used in low to low moderate populations. If the nematode population is too high, they're going to walk through it. What's low to low moderate? Okay. Our threshold level for root knot nematode is 100. 100 juveniles per 100 cc of soil at the end of the year. So anywhere between, say, 75 and 125, if that's what your counts are, that's a ballpark figure for me where I would use these seed treatments. The problem is a lot of our nematode fields are more than that. Okay. Here's the nematicides we have available. Vitae. Okay? Not going to be available. They had a terrible problem with their plants. Had some people killed two years ago. They're still not online. No more Vitae this year. Tell them. Tell them three gallons per acre is our most effective nematicide. It's not easy to put out, but it's getting easier. It's very effective, but it requires the correct soil conditions. Not too wet, not too dry, not too cold, not too hot. And obviously, at three gallons an acre, it's about $60 a tree. But if you need it, it's going to make you money because seeing a two to three to 400 pound lint increase over the susceptible untreated is very common. Timic 15G is gone. Okay? But, but there are rumors that something may come back in a generic formulation. Okay? Right now, they're just rumors. Okay? But just know that there may be something in the future. But regardless of what happens with generic Timic, vellum total is out there. 14 ounce rate. It can be used 16 ounces, 18 ounces, but the 14 ounce rate is where we're looking at cotton. And I can tell you with confidence that 14 ounces of vellum total, as far as nematode control in our trials, has typically been as good as the five pound of Timic rate we would have put out for nematode control when we had Timic. Vellum is not bulletproof. You have to apply it correctly. When we used to put out infro fungicides, and the fungicides, I mean the, uh, the furrow shaped like a V, we used to treat the entire wall. We treated the soil and the seed, so when it collapsed like this, we would have treated the soil. When it comes to vellum total, we want the vellum total put in the furrow at the bottom, 
coating around the seed. We don't care so much about the walls anymore. We care about placement. Keith Rucker, Bear Crap Science, they are very happy to talk to growers about how you get that placement. Whether you turn a flat fan nozzle 90 degrees, whether you dribble it, okay? But placement's critical. 14 ounces is our nematode rate on cotton. When it comes to thrips control, you may want to spike that with something. You want to say anything like that when I got it here right now? Doesn't matter. Usually with the insecticide component in vellum is a middle cloak print. And uh these on. Oh, okay. Is a midocloprid, and uh, I prefer the highest labeled rate of a midocloprid. We'll see a rate response on the insect insect side there, but 14 ounces is, is still it's it's as good, maybe slightly better than the seed treatment on thrips control at that rate. But you know we have opportunities to get that rate on up a little higher to give us a little more efficacy, a little more residual. So you know we we we're still gaining experience, but I I like the rate at the max. Or thrips control, just trying to minimize that likelihood of having to come back with a foliar spray. And the question is, the 18 ounces, and the price is somewhere going to be around $1.89 an ounce. Okay, if 14 ounces is effective for the nematodes, is there a less expensive way to improve your thrips opportunity yeah. while managing the nematodes at the 14 ounce rate? So you can add some of that Meyer Pro to it. Is something we looked at this past year. Just to bring that imidacloprid component. Would you say and put it on a straight string right over the seat? Is it? All indications are right now, and I've been you doing. You don't need a band at all. It's a narrow. You just a narrow. Would you agree with that, Keith? Yes. The best way to do it is just put an orifice in line, put a drop tube down, and you're just streaming it right over the seat. <clears throat> we don't want to spray it. How many gallons? Or acre more. You were going about five gallons. Three, three to five gallons is what's on our label. I've been putting out five gallons. I've been using a flat fan turn cockeyed, all right, but whatever it takes. And again, that's a little bit different from uh, infero seed treatments or infero fungicides, where we were treating not only the seed, but the entire furrow as well, trying to inhibit those fun the fungi which were right there. Now, because the, the intent of a nematicide is different, we're trying to protect those roots growing down. We're trying to pack as much as we can right where those roots will be developing, right where the seed will be. I'll say the same thing. I've, looked, you can, you I've, can I've, I've used both the flat fans and a stream, just a solid stream of liquid. I've had less trouble with the stream. We are we are basically <laughs> recommending now to just go with the stream and not use the flat fan. And a lot of it isn't so much efficacy, but the flat fans have a tend to getting stopped up yep. easier. That's what Whereas happened the me. stream seems like it just it just performs better in the field. So anybody that's putting in a new system, we're recommending we go that way and, and not use the, the, the flat fan tip. And given the fact that the placement is more critical, or let the, the placement is more critical in one location as opposed to a, a broader band, it makes sense. So that's a big thing. That's it. When I hear people say, well, I used, and I see some of the county trials, we'll show some vellum data, when I say, well, we've used vellum, I didn't get out of it what I thought I should. The number one question is, how did you put it out? How did you put it out? Because I think it's, it's critical. Seed treatments are more convenient, easily more convenient, but vellum totals a step above the seed treatments as far as you leave off the seed treatment, that overcoat seed treatment? Great question, great question. We do not look to vellum total to provide us additional seedling disease control. It may provide a little bit, but if I'm trying to get, see, if I want to get, if I want to use vellum total, and I'm worried, that's a great question, if I want to get vellum total for nematode and thrips control, and I'm worried about seedling disease, I'm probably going to still invest in that seed treatment. The vellum total may give a little bit, but not a lot. Well, you don't need the seed treatment for nematicide seed treatment. No, no, I'm talking about seed treatment. You just need the fungicide. Right. Can I say something on that too? The vellum total is not going to have any activity on pythium. It may have some activity on rhizoctonia, but a lot of your seedling diseases, it's just not going to have activity on it. So you definitely don't want to cut corners and not put out a good seed treatment for a disease standpoint. You're going, to, you're going to get your seed treatment anyway, but when I'm talking about like the Trilex Advanced or the Acceleron yeah. or the Dynasty, these that are additional fungicides, if you need additional seedling disease control because of the conditions, then the vellum may give you a little bit more on the rhizoc. But you still, in my opinion, you still need an extra fungicide. Now, fungicides are relatively inexpensive. It's when you start putting the, 
the uh, nematicide mm -hmm. with them. But if you're using vellum total, my recommendation right now is you do not invest in seed treated nematicides. <coughs> Keith, uh, how much, uh, how much? <laughs> yeah. metoclopra do you add in if you use a 14 ounce rate? If you're spiking or admire? There's a maximum amount of a metoclopra that you can put in fur. I can't remember off the top of my head. What is it? you remember, Philip, off yeah. the top of your head? You said like in Meyer Pro, the, the maximum rate's 9.2 ounces. There you go. The vellum total 14 ounce rate's about seven ounces of a, of a Meyer Pro. So we've got opportunities to add a little more. You know, it's not gonna make it a perfect treatment, but you know, 14 ounces is still good on thrips, but you know, we can, while we're there, just a little extra trouble, just a few ounces, but just try to get it to the, and, and, and again, this is, Philip's opinion, you know, go ahead and get to that maximum labeled rate. I mean, just to try to minimize the need to come back. And just so if I've confused anybody, here's the recipe. And you're like this. For wet soils, you're planting your seed that you buy already has two to three fungicides that come with no extra cost, right? Cool wet soils, you're worried about seedling disease, whether you're going to use vellum total or not, you need some extra nematode, I mean, extra seedling disease protection, you need an extra seed treatment. If you have nematode problems that are, what I say, low to moderate, somewhere between 100 and 250, as opposed to 75 and 125, vellum total is a better product. <coughs> vellum total in furrow will help you, help you a little bit with the rhizot, but it does not take away the need for an extra seed treatment for seedling disease, if that's a condition or something that you're worried about. Right? The only thing is, you know, you really buy your seed and you got the Cadillac with all of it. Yeah. And you hate not to buy it. But then what I could leave out would be the end. Yes. If, on, in on my opinion, seat. my if opinion. You use that. That's right. If you're going to use vellum total for nematode control, I don't have the, I personally would not go with the Eris or the Evicta, that extra eighteen or twenty dollars an acre. I would go with vellum total because you've got a nematode problem that's above with that seed treatment. Would do. Okay. Now some people might argue with us, they might say, well I'm going to go ahead and do both, I like the additive effect. When you start to put out, let's say it is $1.89 an ounce, and let's say 14 ounce is about $26, and then you add $18 on top of that for a victim, then you start to say, well why don't I just bump it up a little bit and put tell them out. Okay. So the additive effect of those two nematicides, the seed treatment and vellum total, I would go with the seed treatment and a low population. I'd go with vellum total in a low or a moderate population. Right. Let's talk about these varieties. I got the ones in red that I think are the ones that are going to be most likely to be used. Okay? Fijin 487, Stonewall 4946, Delta Fine 1558. First thing to point out is I got two genes, one gene, two genes. They all share the single gene. They all have one gene in common. And what that gene does is it's the female nematodes that cause all the problems. They infect the root, they set up a feeding site, they form those galls, they lay their eggs. All right? I don't know what the males do in that species, but they don't do much. All right? It's the females causing the problems and doing all the work. What that single gene does is they still get, the females still infect the root, but it's like the plant doesn't recognize that they're there. And if the plant doesn't recognize they're there, it signals for forming the galls does not occur. And if the galls do not form, if the giant cell doesn't form, reproduction damage is almost nullified. That's what the first gene does. They all have it. The second gene, in the 1558 and 487, is less clear. It's less important, but there's definitely an additive effect. 487 and 1558 are absolutely better in terms of nematode control than 4946 as far as the amount of damage and the amount of reproduction. 49-46 does a great job. As far as nematode populations, 15, 58, 47 do a better job. Okay? Now, next thing is, what about yield? Why didn't we plant more 367? Because growers didn't want to be back against the wall as far as yield from the get-go. Okay? 427 was better. 487 has better yield potential than any of these other varieties. Okay? 487 brings better nematode control, better yield potential, and our OBT trials look very good. 
49.46 has one gene. Okay? That's not great, but it's very strong nonetheless. And 49.46, as a variety within the southeast region, has looked very good whether you got nematodes or not. The new one, 1558, all right, two genes. In our trials last year from looking at Jared's data, 1558 has been stopped. Whether you got nematodes or not, 1558 has been a monster as far as your potential. Okay. No grower can tell me now, well they can tell me, but I'm not gonna listen as close as I used to. I can't plant a resistant variety because it doesn't make the yield. These three varieties absolutely <coughs> show you, and especially 1558, show you, you can make yields and at the same time, imagine that approach. All right, now, when we talk about cost, anybody know how much a bag of 1558 costs over a bag of 1252? What's the price differential in a bag of seed? $25. And if you average that bag of seed out over the acreage, you're spending about $3 an acre for incredible nematode control. Okay? $3 an acre for incredible nematode control. It's a tremendous bargain. It's a tremendous value. Okay? We've got to think about doing it. A little bit about data. Okay? Just to show you how this works. These are <coughs> nematodes at the end of the season. On 499 and 1050, this was in Culpeper County. We were up to three times our threshold level. 300 up to 150. This is nematode populations on a susceptible variety. There's Stoneville 4946, a great reduction from what we got with the susceptible varieties. But if you look at the 1558, the 1454, the 427, the 487, we almost eliminated nematode populations. Calvin, this is Craig's field, okay? I've been there for 15 years. I've made most of my recommendations based upon data collected in there and other fields. We won't go back this year. After one year of peanuts and two years of testing these nematode resistant varieties, we can no longer get reliable nematode damage out of a field we used to kid about the nematodes crawled across the soil. That's what that's done. When we look at galls, 499, 4946, and then these nematode resistant varieties with two genes, all right? A big step from 499 to 4946, but our dual genes have done even better. When we look at yield, Okay? In this field last year, we did not see the telone, the bellum total, nothing really improved our yield in this field. But what stood out was, if you look across all these varieties, 1558 with either a C treatment with telone or bellum total. Didn't matter which, 1558 at that nematode field last year was a clear standout. Right? Don't care what you do, but nematode resistant varieties are here. Continue to use it. Tom Windhausen study. Here's the amount of damage: 50% root damage with 499. If we put telone underneath the 499, went from 50% to 13%. But the phytogen 487, with nothing except for thrips control, was at 4%. That cost you $60. That cost you $3. Okay? I love telone. Okay? I love telone. But you can see what you got for $3. When we look at yields, it's not as easy as I'd like it to be. Because here's the 487 with nothing underneath it. $3 an acre. Here's the 499 with telone. All right, we got better yields where we put telone with 499. And the clear winner in the trial was 1944 with its yield potential with telone underneath it. So we have to reconcile the fact that when we put telone out, sometimes we're going to get better yields. But we got to look at what the value of the yield is versus what it cost us to make that yield. Telone and vellum total absolutely have a place, but we got to look at the economics of where they fit. What about these resistant varieties in telone? Well, we're talking about telone. It's trial two years ago. This is 49.46, which has nematode resistance. 49.46 plus telone. Okay, it's not uncommon in a tough nematode situation, especially where we've only got one gene for resistance. Telone still brings it. Still brings it. Telone's an outstanding product. We have to look, we're putting dollars and cents, the cost of telone to the increase in value. A lot of times in a susceptible variety, we might make 400 pounds more of length with telone in a tough situation. Okay? What's the value versus the cost? 
In that same trial, this is two years ago in Craig, it's starting to drop already, but you see whether we were planting 1454 or 367 or 427, the red bar is taller than the blue bar. Red bar is where we put telone out, blue bar is where we didn't. We continue to see an increase in yield. Right. Just doesn't always make it. You can't buy sixty or sixty dollars worth of telone with sixty-seven pounds of cotton. Vellum right. total. We got it in 2015 on cotton and peanuts. I can stand here now and tell you that vellum total is a player in our inventory management. The two key factors are three key factors. One, it doesn't matter what kind of nematode it is. Any of these nematodes, it doesn't matter what kind of nematode it is. Vellum total goes after it. The second thing is, vellum total for our rate in cotton is going to be 14 ounces. It can be bumped up. If you want to use it for increased nematode control and thrips control, you can do it, but 14 ounces seems to be appropriate for the low to moderate populations we're talking about. So we're between 100 and 250 ball juvenile counts. Right? The third thing is, we talked about it, placement's absolutely critical. Okay. A little bit of data. The red bar is tenic. This is from 2013. Red bar is tenic. Light blue bar is 14 ounces of vellum. The dark blue bar is the 18 ounces. Here's not treating. 35 galls per root system with uh, not treating, with just gaucho. 12 with tenic. A little bit more with the 14 ounce, 20, and 11 with 18 ounces of vellum. Okay? We're in the ballpark. Here's our standard. Here's what we're looking at. But when we look at yields, seed cotton, this is our yield with nothing except for thrips control. The red bar is Timic. Our blue bar over there, 37.63, is 14 ounces of vellum. Don't ask me why the 18 ounces of vellum wasn't just as good. I'm sure it was. There's a little bit of slop in these numbers. But the thing to take home is I can be very confident that if we use the vellum total in the right nematode populations and we put it out right, and we take care of thrips, we're in a good situation. Right? Questions on that? 14 ounces on cotton, recommendation on peanut is 18 ounces. 14 versus 18. Okay? Putting telone out, just an advertisement. One of the reasons why we don't put telone out in fields, we should put telone out, is because of the expense, and I don't blame you. But the root knot nematodes tend to be in the sandier areas of the field. The whites and light pinks on this graph are the sandier areas in the field. Calvin did a lot of this work helping develop it. If we apply telone, if we map a field based upon soil type, and then treat with the telone in red or a reduced rate in orange based upon soil type, we can save up to 50%. That's where you might put the vellum out. That's where we might put the seed treatment out. Put the telone out where you need it. We can maintain yields, maintain protection, cut our telone rates by as much as 50%, by putting it out in the right place. Okay? That's something critical. If we want to get the most out of telone and the most economics. Okay? Last topic. And that is foliar diseases. Okay? Foliar diseases are something that I never thought we would have to manage as far as fungicides went, but I absolutely believe now that every cotton growing state needs to be prepared to use fungicides in the right place, the right time to manage and promote their yield. Okay? We're going to be working with you. We've got a student who's working. We're going to be looking at the breeding lines coming out of Georgia and other places to see. Is there resistance in these lines that we don't have to worry about a disease like target spot? Okay? But right now, it's not just a 499 problem. It's a cotton problem. Okay? But before I talk about that, I never talked about this in a meeting before because I never had to. I've been here 16 seasons now. And this is the first season that we've had an outbreak of angular leaf spots. It's a bacterial disease. If you look at the spots, that's some that's have expanded, but they start out, and you'll see that they look like little computer chips in there. Okay? They follow the veins. It's a bacteria. The infection occurs, and the veins on the leaf bind where the, the bacteria goes. They move. Okay? You have wet, greasy appearances. And you can have sunken lesions on the bowls as well. You can get a bowl rot associated with the angular leaf spot. 16 seasons, I've seen it occasionally. Last year, it was a major problem in some fields in southwest Georgia. Okay? Here's the message for you on this, if you hear anything about this. All right? First off, if you're growing cotton in Arkansas or in Mississippi or Alabama, they cry about this disease every year. 
Okay? It's something that affects them. For us, it doesn't usually happen. Last year we did. Mark West, did you have fields that had it? What would you say the yield loss in those fields was? As far as a percentage? Well, we had some irrigated cotton in my eyes on our final. Okay. So, so you may have cut your yields by 50%. Okay. okay. All right. Now, the ticket on this is we don't know if it's going to come back again or not, but it was worse and almost always found on one variety. And it's a variety that I really like. And it's a variety I have not mentioned one time today. 1454. 1454 in fields where they did not have angular leaf spot performed well. It's a root knot nematode resistant variety. It looks good. In fields where they had this, they said they'll never plant it again. My suggestion going in, if you want to avoid the chance of having this disease, is don't plant 1454. And hopefully, we didn't see it much on other varieties. Even 1558, which I like so much, had a little bit, but not like this. I we think see it was some. But nothing like in the 14. In 1454, the dry lining cotton last year was better than irrigated cotton. For some reason, it was a lot, lot worse than irrigated cotton. And the white reason is, why would it be worse than irrigated cotton? Because this disease, this bacteria, moves and spreads through rain splash, through irrigation splash. So it makes sense. It loves moisture. Dry land, we'd have a lot less problem with it. I asked my buddy in Mississippi, I said, what's the yield cost of this? Well, we typically see 200 pounds of lint loss of this. And I said to him, I said, well, Tom, I said, with target spot, I tell you every year, 200 pounds of lint we can protect. And you laugh at me. You say, it doesn't matter. So why does it matter with this disease, but not this disease? No one argues that this disease, annual leaf spot, matters. We have to convince growers every year about the target spot. Okay? What I'm going to finish up with is, what do we do about target spot? The way you can do it is this. If it's 10 o'clock in the morning and you walk through the cotton, it's knee high and your pants come out dry and you don't have green streaks on them. Okay, by the way, this is one of the few pair of pants I own. <laughs> it's not covered in green. If your pants come out clean, you don't have to worry about target spot. If it's 1 o'clock in the afternoon and you walk out and the cotton's up to here and you walk out and the green streaks and you know what I'm talking about, that is a field that's a candidate for target spot. And the closer you are to Wes and Mark, in southwest Georgia, the hotter you are for this disease. And this disease, I promise you, costs you when it's bad. It's not just $4.99. I don't know how much his yield is lost, but I can tell you all we can protect with a good fungicide program is about 200, 250 pounds. Okay? These are the fungicides. It's amazing. These are the fungicides we have labeled that you can spend your money on. And it's a little bit confusing, so I'm going to narrow them down for you right now. <coughs> I'm going to tell you the ones that I'm not recommending this year simply because I don't either have enough data or I don't think they work as well as the other ones. Twin line. It's labeled. I don't recommend it. Okay? Elatus. Got a late label. It may be Cracker Jack, but I don't have enough data to go out there and tell you that this is the product to use. Elatus is a new fungicide from Syngenta. It's awesome on peanut. It's a combination product. It may be a part of the solution, but right now we need more information. If you use it, May work well, but I don't have the data. Top Guard, that got labeled last year, and I just don't have enough data on it. Okay? I'd be careful, not to tell you not to use it, but be careful. Here's the recommendation, Preaxor. Preaxor, if we're gonna manage target spot on cotton, at first bloom, I'm deciding whether I need to make an application or not. If it's very hot, if it's very dry, if the cotton yield potential is off, if you're not seeing a problem with it, if there's nothing out there, I might not spray it the first week of bloom, but the first week of bloom has been a part of our solution. Okay? That first application going out is going to be Preaxor. Why? Preaxor is better than Headliner Quadris, and it has a dual mode of action that protects against resistance. Second thing is, if I put the Preaxor out at first week of bloom, or third week of bloom, whenever I put it out, within two to three weeks afterwards, I'm going to look for a second application, and that will either be headline or quadrus. Okay? If the conditions don't favor another application, I'll stick with preaxor. But if I need two applications to make that yield, preaxor, headline, or quadrus. Should you be worried about target spot? What's the growth? If we're pushing yield potential, if we have high yield potential crops, if we're pouring the fertility to it, if we got the irrigation on it, if we've lost control to some degree of growth promoting with the cotton's high in rank, that's where that disease comes in. If you don't care about 200 to 250 pounds of lint, if that doesn't impress you, then don't worry about this disease. 
If you haven't had the problem in the past, you're less likely to have it now, but be aware of it. Okay? Last line. A lot of times growers say, well, show me the data. Okay, this was at Stripling Irrigation Park. Calvin helped us with this last year. This is seed cut, but we do the conversions. We're right about 200 pounds of lint. Our best treatments would be the headlines and the preaxors. Okay, headlines and preaxors what we're recommending. When you do the conversions, we're looking about 200 pounds of lint. And that is statistically significant. We see this all the time. People say, well, it's not statistical. Except for the pattern's the same. Well, don't talk to us about patterns, all right? This is statistically significant. Increases in yield, stripling irrigation far last year, combination of preaxial and headline. If you were to ask me why headline here, two applications of headline was the best yielder, why wouldn't you just keep doing that? You can. But the problem is, is the headline is very sensitive to resistance management, or resistance occurring. Preaxial takes that out of the equation. I'm going to stop. What rate preaxial? What rate preaxial? That is four ounces. You have any benefit if you don't have target spot? Great question. If you don't have target spot, should we be spraying the cotton? I would. That's the question with the angular leaf spot out there. I had some people spray. I'll tell you a story. This is a true story, and I'll stop there, okay? Two years ago, a grower sprayed every acre. This is in mid George, not where you are. Every acre of their crop because they thought they had target spot and it was stemphilium leaf spot, which is tied to potassium deficiency. And it made them absolutely normal. It was a mistake. If you don't have target spot, don't spray it. What I want you to remember is El Nino is setting cotton growers up to problems, whether it's nematode management or seedling disease. We got varieties, we got nematicides now for every situation you have. And this target spot and the angular release spot, we can manage either by variety selection or by the fungicide choice. We've gone a little bit long, I always do, not too bad. Any questions for me before we start? Stop. Hey, one more, one quick question on the belt. Or, yes. Uh, split. Oh, excellent question. Uh, just if you are twin row peanuts, okay, this is what you just kind of hang my head, you know. Twin row peanuts, you're going to be using 18 ounces. You're going to put nine ounces in each. Tour, all right. Now that's the bad news. The good news is the nine ounces is not as good as 18 ounces, but from trials that Tim Brenneman's done. Nine ounces in each twin is stout compared to not using it at all. It still has no code effect. For those of you who came in here, and I know nobody came in here for pesticide credits, but anybody who thought about doing that, we got the uh, private applicator and we got the commercial applicator.